นะครับเอาขอบคุณพระเจ้าที่ได้ให้เราสามารถมาเยี่ยมพระเจ้าในสิ่งที่เราต้องการพระเจ้าเราต้องการพระเจ้าในสิ่งที่เราต้องการพระเจ้าในส
He never overlooks a single me in the bigger we. Now, I want to tell you something. I want you to look back at that little portion where he said, well, since, you know, since I'd investigated it from the beginning, it just seemed good also to me. Everybody say also to me. Also. Say it one more time. Also to me. Also. Now, take your finger right here and go also to me. I, I, I want to pitch out to you because this kept rolling around in my blonde head. I, I keep thinking about the fact that in our present culture especially, this ties to what we were talking about at the end of our last session together, um, you know, what we want, we want to be different. We want to be the one that is special and the one that sticks out. We don't want to be an also. Do you think that's fair to say? Like we want to be the one. Um, we want to be exceptional, uh, not, not an also. Um, we want to be like an original. And yet scripture says, really, you know what? You're, you're an also. Um, we want to be like autonomous and do this thing by ourselves. And people see that Christ is large and in charge through us. And actually he says, you know what? I called you to be an also. And there's just nothing about also that really does ring our bell. You know, we want to be, we want to go where no man has gone before. Oh, speaking of man, remember when I was telling y'all earlier, this is how Bible study is, is live. It is so messy. It's so messy. I'm so sorry. I was starting to tell y'all about one of the guys on the team. You know what he told me over the break, the one that does the microphone? He told me, he says, Beth, it's not just a her in hermeneutic. There is a men in hermeneutic. Her men nudic. Her men nudic. Yes, somebody say amen. And there's, also an, there's also an amen. There's also men in amen. Amen? That's just how it should be. But, you know, we want to go where no man has been before, and yet Hebrews 6.20 says that Jesus has already gone there before us. Uh, we want to be the one and only, and yet John 1.18 says Jesus is already the one and only. As much as we just want to be the big original, we're called to be, uh, well, it just seemed good to me also. Others had written accounts. Why did there need to be another one? Well, because it just seemed to be good to Luke also. Is anybody getting that with me? He didn't mind being an also. Somebody say Luke did not mind being an also. Let me hear you say it. And, and I want to tell you today why you and I don't want to mind being called to the big also as well. Here's what I'm going to do. And for just a moment, what you're going to see on the screen is just one scripture after another. I'm going to read the scripture out loud. But in every single scripture, you're going to see where there's a word also and that it's bold. And what I want you to do is that when I read that sentence and it gets to the word also, I want you to scream it out into the heavenlies. And I'm just, here's the question on the table. Should you mind and should I mind just being another big also? All right, let's go. Luke 8, 1 through 2. The 12 were with him and also. some women. Luke 12, 8. I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will Acknowledge him before the angels of God. Luke 16, 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. John 10, 16. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. This is when he's talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. I must bring them. They will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I am going to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. John 14, 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also. will live. Romans 1, 6. And you also. are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 30. And those he predestined, he also. called. Those he called, he also. justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Romans 8, 32, who he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also. along with him graciously give us all things? How about 1 Corinthians 6, 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us. Also. Ephesians 1, 11, in Christ we were also. chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1, 13, and you 
were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Second Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many other witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also. be qualified to teach others. First Peter 2.5, you like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. First John 1 John 1.3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. And 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not to me only, but to all who have longed for his appearing. I just want you to think, oh, blessed also. Is that enough for you? That's enough for me. There's something about an also that should be a very, very beautiful, beautiful thing to us. Do, do you guys like um, acronyms when you like make a sentence out of a word? I love them. So here's, I'm just going to pitch out some also's to you. Here's what also can mean to us. Another life snatched out. Another life sold out. Another life sent out, another life standing out, another life sticking out, another life spilled out, another life spent out. And when we close our eyes on this sweet earth, girlfriend, we're going to be another life swept out, just swept out. And you know what I want to say to you? Not bad for a bunch of run-of-the-mill also's. Amen. I want you to look at one another and say, you want to be an also. Oh, this is a place we want to be. This is a place we want to be. I, I got to tell you something. I was thinking about how many of you wrote in as singles on the blog and just said, you know, I'm trying to figure this out with God. Uh, some of you were happier about it than others. Some of you were happier to be married than others. That's kind of how it is on both sides of that. But I was thinking about a quote that I found from an early church father um, that this, so one of these, this is a historical rather than biblical a statement, but it describes Luke and I'm quoting here, he served the Lord without distraction, having neither wife nor children. Luke must have been one of the most eligible bachelors in all of Antioch. I, maybe that's why he ran for his life, I don't know. But, <laughs> but he did not run for his wife. He just ran for his life. But I want you to see those words, without distraction. And, you know, I don't know why God may have you in the place where you find yourself right now. I, but I, I can tell you this. You have, as you look at the lives of Luke and Paul on the pages of Acts, you have the opportunity to have a flexibility and a ministry that, that most of us married women will never dream of. Isn't that true? I tell you, girl, I'd be saving my money and going on every single mission trip I could get my feet into. I mean, there is a world to see. I, when I said my boots were made for walking, I'm one of those that loves an airplane. I mean, I, I love it. I mean, as soon as we start taking off on the runway, my heart kind of, I kind of catch my breath and go, let's go, let's go. I, I want to go ye there for anybody else. I want to, I want to. And that's an opportunity that you have. I was also talking to my coworkers the other day. Um, we were talking, uh, several of, of us, I'm not, I'm not one of them, mine are older um, young adults and now both of my daughters, but several of them have kids that are in college. And this doesn't just happen when you're in college, this just happens in life uh, when you are a mother, that you are supposed to somehow have telepathic powers to fix things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because like, like you're nowhere near it. There's absolutely nothing you can do. And one of your children will call you and just like spill it. And like, I mean, like they're just like urgent. Like, I mean, like do something. And it's sort of like we want to go like this on the phone. Okay, honey, hold on just a moment. <laughs> and we're just like fixing it in our mind. You know, like, okay, all right, darling, it should be fixed now. I mean, like, what can we do? I mean, we just like, oh, we just angst. But nothing changes because we cannot fix it. But I want to remind you of a Savior to whom the centurion came. He said, you know what? You don't even need to come to my house. And it doesn't tell us that, that Jesus went like this. It doesn't tell us that he just like squinted his eyes. It didn't tell us that he, he um, got all up in it. It just says, you know, go home. He's healed. He's healed. He's the one that can go from afar 
He's the one that can fix it. And I pray he's going to fix some things for us today. Now look back at that prologue, Luke 1, 1 through 4. And let me tell you some, what I think, uh, I hope you'll think are some fascinating things about it. Um, do you know that these first four verses, in fact, why don't you go ahead and get hold of Acts 28, 2. I told you that not 28 verse 2, but 28 in the very end. I want you to hold them both in your hand and let me tell you something about them. Now remember, who wrote these two books? The third and fifth, Luke. Luke wrote both of them, third and fifth books of the Bible. Everybody say third and fifth. All right, we got Luke in our hands, Luke 1 in our hands, and we've got the very end of Acts 28. Are you looking at the very last two verses? I'm going to read them out to you in the last session, but I don't want to jump ahead right now. But I just want you to notice with me that we've got 28 uh, through um, 31, actually 28 through 31, three, the last three verses, and then we've got the first four verses of Luke. Do you know that those two segments, the very beginning of Luke and the very end of Luke, are written in such highly stylized Greek that it is of the caliber of the most gorgeous and beautiful um, literature in all of the ancient world. And he wrote with such beauty and artistry in this very beginning, and certainly through the whole thing, but I just want you to, to note something with me. He uses a certain kind of Greek in the first four verses and then in the last three verses because he's, he's coming to those that, are, that may be of means. We're going to learn something about Theopolis in just a second. He's coming to them and bringing a, an educated, investigative reporting that he himself has done. And he begins it and ends it with this very, very high and educated Greek. But in all the center portion of both books, he is using more of a layman's language, so he speaks to all of us. One of the commentators said something that I found fascinating. He said that in the beginning, Luke is doing what, what other historians did back in his day. A very, very um, prominent, very educated people that were writing books. And you'll notice that he intended to be writing books and not just letters. He says in the very beginning of Acts, as we will see later in our time together, in my former book. So this is a two-book um, series that Luke is writing. And what we're going to find is that where he starts it in that, in that gorgeous Greek and then ends it in it, what I learned is that even in those days, um, it was rolled, of course, into a scroll. And that the way they would know if it was something they wanted to read is they would pull out, they could see just the top lines. And so the top lines would say, I've written this to you so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So peeking in, this is all they might have seen before they began to unfold that entire scroll and see what the gospel of Luke had to say. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to compare Luke 1.1 1, 1 with Acts 1.1. 1, 1. Luke 1.1 1, 1 with Acts 1.1. 1, 1. This is how he starts both of these books. Luke 1 verse 3 says, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good. This little phrase should mean something to you now. What does it say? Everybody say, also to me. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Then Acts 1.1 says this, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. We'll be back to the rest of that portion a little later in our time together. I love the fact that it says that he wrote about all Jesus began to do and teach. Because, girlfriend, we are proof, all 180,000 of us are proof that he's not done yet. Not done teaching, not done working in our midst. But in both letters, he is addressing it. He has dedicated both of these books to an, a, a person by the name of Theophilus. Everybody say Theophilus. Theophilus. And it's, it's very, very intriguing what the name means. And you may be aware of it. I've got it on a PowerPoint for you um, uh, so that you can take this down. Theophilus is a name that it's a compound word, and it is a personal name. There were a number of people in the early uh, centuries um, uh, AD that did have this name. 
So um, Theophilus is a word, it's made of theos, which is God, and philos, which is friend. Theos, philos. And Theophilus means friend of God. It means friend of God. Does anybody find that just a little bit fascinating? Now, here's, here's what a number of scholars have, have thrown out before us for consideration. Um, there are some that think he's speaking to all of us symbolically because it becomes very clear that in his mind, he knew that it was going to have a public kind of publication, so to speak. So there, there are people that think, no, the name Theophilus is meant for all of us. It's meant to friends of God. There are other people that say, no, no, it was a pseudonym for someone it was too dangerous um, to call by name. But others just go, no, no, it's an actual name. It's, it's, he's writing it to a person that he knows. One reason why they think that's probably true is because in Luke, he refers to him as most excellent Theophilus, whereas in the second book, he just calls him by his name. And what, what we learn is that many that were um, in government positions, those in very, very prominent kinds of places in, um, in this early um, Christian world, uh, very often, like two times in Acts, um, there, are, there are Roman officials that are called most excellent. And so he probably is calling this to a real-life person, most excellent Theophilus. In fact, I found out through my study um, that it's something that is called an, an honorific title. To call someone most excellent is an honorific title. I thought, you know what? I've heard of terrific. I've heard of horrific. I even I learned yesterday that there's a word called Twitterific, but as I live and breathe, I've never known to call anything honorific. I, I named my border collie uh, Queen Esther because I was writing Esther at the time that I got her, and now I know that when I call her Queen Esther, I am giving her an honorific title. So if 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 you Anytime you're calling, calling somebody by that kind of a name, that's an honorific, and that's what he's doing with Theophilus. But so it could be that it was any of the above. But I'm going to tell you, it's awfully strange. Certainly, I just want to say that chances are it's a real-life person. There's one guy that he knows by the name of Theophilus, and he knows also it will go out to many, many listeners. But it's also strange. What did I tell you Theophilus means? Say it again. It's also very fascinating that Luke, by far, mentions friend, friends, or friendship more than any other writer in the New Testament. He makes reference in his parables to friends. There's even the reference he makes. Remember the group of women, the tasphilos, the girlfriends that, that uh, celebrate with the woman who has found something uh, very valuable that she'd been missing. And he tells these parables more than anybody else. He brings up the issue of friendship 16 times in his gospel as opposed to four times in Matthew, four times in Mark, and seven times in John. Something about that is wonderfully suspicious. I want to show you one in particular that has everything to do with us. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 31 through 35 with you. Luke 7, what's our verse going to be? 31, I want to read 31 through 35 to you. Luke 7, 31. This is Jesus talking. If you've got a red letter edition, you can see that. To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And he says something so profound in verse 35, but it's in lofty enough language that it's hard for us to bring it down in terms that we can see. Verse 35, don't let me forget to come to 34, that's where we're going. But 35 says, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. Wisdom is proved right by all her children. Let me say this to you before we go back to the heart of it at 34. 
That, that saying, that was very much a proverb uh, that Jesus was sharing with these listeners. And it means that sometimes you do not know what is wise until it bears out its harvest. He said, I will prove right. I will prove right. And it will show that I was wise by the people I came and ministered to because wisdom will be proved right by the children it will produce. And he says something. He said, you call me, and I want you to see this little phrase because it's one of the most important reasons we're gathering in this second session. He said, you call me friend of sinners. Friend of sinners. And strangely, the very next thing we learn from Luke after Jesus says, you, you say that John has a demon and he does none of this. I meet with the people. I sit at the table with him. And yet you're going to call me a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And the very next thing we see, do you have captions over your Bible? What does the next portion talk about? Can, can you tell it? Does it have a little title up above it? What does it say? Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. You know that story. You know, when Jesus is meeting uh, with the, the Pharisees and dining with them and, and teachers of the law and, and Simon, and in comes this woman like, who, who cannot get hold of her emotions, pouring out her tears, anointing his feet with her tears, dropping her hair down and wiping them. And they're horrified. They're absolutely horrified. And I want you to see the words in verse 47 where it says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has forgiven little, who has been forgiven little, loves little. That is one of the most profound truths of the kingdom right there. I, I want you to see with me that what the Pharisees sitting at that table did not realize is that that day they were the sinners Jesus was friend to. Anybody know what I'm saying? We better thank God Almighty that Jesus Christ came to be a friend to sinners like us. We better praise the God who saved us for a Savior who is drawn to weakness. Anybody amen that with me? I want you to know something about Luke's gospel that sticks out in, in its uniqueness. All of the gospels inspired by God to, to come from a different perspective, to bring the whole story together. But in, in Luke's gospel, he very interestingly uh, portrays before the reader the opportunity for, re, for literally universal redemption the opportunity for anyone to come in. There's something that he does throughout his gospel, a way of showing that outcasts became insiders. And why? Because he was an outcast. He was a Gentile writer among Jewish men who were inspired. He was himself an outsider, himself a second-generation Christian. He mentions Samaritans. He mentions the, the Gentiles being brought into the kingdom. He mentions publicans, sinners, outcasts, the poor, as well as the rich. He, more than any other gospel writer, mentions Jesus' interaction in the lives of women. He's the one that tells us about Elizabeth and Mary and Anna and Joanna, the widow of Nain, the sinful woman that anointed him. I, I want you to hear something that so um, flooded my soul when I came upon this in my um, research. It is a quote by Eusebius, who was a fourth century Roman historian, a believer in Christ and a Roman historian. And so he's part of the early church, and he writes something about Luke, our same guy that we are studying today. And he says this, listen carefully, because there's especially a phrase I want you to hear. Luke, being by birth one of the people of Antioch, by profession a physician, having been with Paul a good deal, and having associated intimately with the rest of the spotless, I just love that he calls us the spotless, has left us examples of the art of curing souls that he obtained from them in two divinely inspired books. Listen to that again. He, Luke, has left us examples of the art
of curing souls. I wonder if that resonates with anybody besides me. Do you know that the aspect, the perspective of the physician as the writer of the Gospel of Luke is seen over and over and over? I jotted down a few. He writes down, he's the one that tells us that Jesus said, you're going to say of me in Luke 4, 34, 23, physician, heal yourself. It was in Luke 5, 17 that, that Luke writes that the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. In Luke 5, 31, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Isn't it interesting that all of this was inspired to Luke rather than anyone else? He mentions the healing, more healings than Matthew and Mark together. He talks about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law and the man that was full of leprosy and the, the centurion's sick servant. But there's one I want you to see. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Told to us only. By Luke, the beloved physician, it says this. I'm at Luke 13. I want to start reading to you at verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and she praised God. I want to go further with you, just a little further in the account, in verse 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. In other words, how dare you be healed today? Today is not the day for healing. For some of us, we may think, you know, healing doesn't happen on a Saturday. It should only happen on a Sunday. And for all those who have rules around healing, this parable and this account speak straight into our experience. Uh, one of the times, you know, you, just get, you get your feelings hurt a lot in ministries, but some of you that, that um, are out there just kind of like doing the thing, you, you probably uh, attest to that. And I can remember something that really, really um, got me one time. A woman at my church and I, that I've been to for nearly 30 years um, had seen us in Bible study on a Tuesday night, really praying for a number of those that had been, um, that had come to the front uh, for prayer at the end of Bible study. And just like, I mean, they were just weeping. And we were just like, as many of us as possible, just laying hands on them and praying for them. And, and she said to somebody there, she said, the next thing you know, she'll be having healing services. And I was just like, so astonished because I, I had not had that kind of, I had gotten very little of that from my church. But I thought to myself, and what would be wrong with Jesus coming and healing in our midst? Some of us need healing, don't we? What would be wrong with that? But some people would rather there be no healing at all than anybody feel the least bit uncomfortable. And I want you to look into these passages. It says that, that the Lord answered him in verse 15, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? I'm just going to be forthright with you. I am praying today that God is going to come into our midst by way of the Spirit of Christ, and He's going to heal some of us women from things that have absolutely kept us under attack for 18 solid years. Maybe, maybe yours is eight years. Maybe yours is 10 years. Maybe yours is six months. But I just want you to hear today, God has a way to bring us to our feet. You know the part of it that gets me the most? The part of this account that can almost bring me to tears every single time is when it says, notice that in verse 11, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. She could not what? 
Say it again. She couldn't straighten up at all. And you know, you know what just keeps just haunting me about that? I can remember uh, being that woman who just couldn't straighten up. I wanted to. I, I was raised in the church. I, I knew how you were supposed to act. I, I want you to understand with me, I had a sense of shame on me from the time I, I was in the first and second grade. I could look around me in, in our worship services at my church, and I could wish that I was this little girl or that little girl. Now, what in the world could a first or second grader have done of that kind of depth of sin to give her that kind of shame? See, um, so a number of you may know my story. I'm just going to keep telling it as long as anyone will listen. Before I even have memory, I fell victim to sexual abuse. And I was just um, oh, devastated by it off and on from that little to about this tall. And you talk about something getting a hold of you. And you don't, you don't have to have that kind of background to have a destructive past. We are all by our human nature. Our lies, uh, the lies our hearts will tell us are beyond anything we'll hear of deception from anyone around us. My own heart will lie to me more than you will ever lie to me. Would anybody say that's true? So we, we'd all have that self-destructive tendency, um, whether or not you come from my background. But what I do want you to understand is that I, I came... Not only was I victimized, but then I, you know, came of age, came into young adolescence, and then I began making the world's stupidest decisions. There's no one, I, I'm confident of this, 180,000 of you, and I can confidently tell you, even those of you who are behind a locked door, you could not possibly have out me. You, you might have stayed in a hole longer, but I can't fathom how you went deeper. I have a real background. This is not false humility. I have a real life background of heinous sin. I, I was so messed up. I, I would honestly, I was just drawn to anything that would help me self-destruct. I told the Lord yesterday as I was just, I was thinking of you and I was thinking of coming to minister to you and I was thinking on so many of the things that, that Luke um, is uh, uniquely inspired to tell us. And I sit to the Lord out loud with just tears, just driving in my car while I was coming home from the hairdresser, just to give you the whole um, picture here. And I just was weeping on my way back home. And I told the Lord, I said, you, you've made my life. I said, Lord, and I tell, I, this is not an, 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 an over drama here. I'm tell, I don't think I would be alive. I do not think that I would be alive. I, I just can't picture if I had kept going how I was going. And listen, I had a heart for God. This is what I want you to hear. Girl, I had a heart for God. But my inner man, I was so wrecked up that I would no more than make the next promise to him of how I was going to live my life and how I was never, does this sound familiar to anybody? I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do it again. And I would mean it and I would cry. I would I'd just cry in my pillow and I'd ask the Lord all the time, all the time, Sheila, I would ask the Lord, why do I do what I do? I need to know if anybody can relate with what I'm talking about. And I couldn't straighten up. I couldn't straighten up. I, I remember one time, I, I'm going to say, I don't think I've ever said this in public, and now I'm going to say it in front of 180,000 people. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm not going to tell you who said it. But somebody that really just should have loved me more than her own skin one time said to me, you will be pregnant before you're 16 years old. I couldn't straighten up. You know what? I wish now I would have had the wherewithal to say back to that person who had a very, very big place in my life, help me. Help me. Help me. I can't stop. I don't know how to stop. I can't. I mean, I just like pick it out. If it will hurt me, I pick it out. And that's what I do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I wanted to straighten up. I wanted to straighten up. And do you know that I didn't have to straighten up before Jesus came to me? I was all bent over and he came and he picked me out. He picked me out right while I was all bent over. 
And, and he even just, he laid his hands on me, it says, that he literally was not scared uh, to touch her. And that she, it was only after he came to her and began to heal her infirmity of all of those years. It was only then, only then, that she could straighten up. We keep praying for our teenager to straighten up. We tell our husband, straighten up. We, we tell the people that are just like living in defeat around, straighten up. And they just stay bent over. And the more shame, the more bent over they get. Am I telling anybody the truth? Maybe it's just me and my weird kind. But there's a lot of shame on a whole lot of us that's been there for years. I read a letter from one of you in this room that was coming to this site this weekend um, that told me that you were four months clean of a 14-year pornography addiction. 14 years. I want to tell you, I, I was fascinated by her story. I want to tell you how, what the enemy used to get her in. I mean, nothing in her was looking for this. She was a, a young teenager when someone gave her family a computer. And th whoever had it before them had looked up so many pornographic sites that when she clicked onto it, it began to bring them up. And she said from the beginning, she was mesmerized and caught up by it. Over and over again, she said something I thought was so fascinating. I wrote down um, her quote because I love this. She wanted me, she said, you tell them, she wanted me to tell y'all, you tell them that a woman can be just as addicted as a man. And then she said this, and this is going to sound familiar to my testimony that I just shared with you. She said, I did love Jesus. I just never talked to him about my addiction. She said something that's going to become so important to us in our few minutes together. She said, I separated it out from everything that had to do with him. I had my, let me use this word, even though it's not politically correct, I had my sinful life, and then I had my church life. And I mean, she and what became her man were completely immersed in ministry life, and then going home and watching porn all evening long. They said there were no, no telling how many times that there were, there were kids, their own youth group, in that home where all of that was done, and they would leave, and that's what they would turn to. Straighten up! Only she couldn't. She couldn't. And she said it was not until she began, and y'all, I cannot help but think that I'm supposed to share this with you, because the same was true for me. She said it was not until God brought her to a place to memorize Scripture that she got it so far inside of her mind where every single time images began to come up, every single time old pictures began to be stirred up in her mind, every single time all of her past haunted her, she would begin to speak out a Scripture. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you begin when the enemy tries to harass you or torment you over your past or over old images that are in your mind or over bitterness and unforgiveness, terrible things that have happened to you, if you take every opportunity he torments you and you begin to spout off Scripture, girlfriend, he's going to start leaving you alone. If you think the devil wants to drive you to spout Scripture, you are out of your darling, ever-loving little mind. And the more we come back at it, she said, it has saved my life. What was she doing? First Peter 1.22 told us that. When he said that we purify our souls by walking in obedience to the truth. I just, I beg you as one who has been there, I would never speak to you in condemnation or judgment. I've been too far down in the pit for that. But I will tell you that your abundant life is in your obedience to God. It's in letting Him to every part of your life where this now becomes our dialogue, where this is what we talk about with Him. I also come from a background of um, addictive sin. Um, it's all, um, all manner of addiction is all over my family, even in my, my immediate family of origin. Like, we just got alcoholics all over the place. It's just, we are just addicts. We are just addicts. And I know what it's like to think 
to yourself, there's no way I'm going to be free of this. I'm always going to be under this. There's no way. I, I can't picture not having it in a month, and yet God will come back to you and go, how about today? Could you get through just one day? Just one day? Because He gives us this day our daily bread. You don't have to wonder about next year. Every single day that we live off of the power and authority of God, that's where our victory comes back in. Girlfriend, listen, your victory is in His authority. I promise you that. I don't know a lot of things, but I know this, and believe you me, I have tried it. Your determination will not be enough. You do not have it in you to straighten yourself up. Your victory is in Christ's authority. It's in taking the very things that you're most ashamed of and bringing them out in the light before me and going, Lord, okay, you know, Father, that that, that addiction I've got, now, Lord, here's where I really need you to get to me. And what I began to ask God, when I wanted to turn to my addiction, I asked God to begin to show me what was it that preceded my defeat? What was it that happened just beforehand when I would turn to the left and I knew it was an attack of insecurity? That I would all of a sudden feel very insecure about something and then I would turn over to the left. And God began to show me that when that feeling would come up, how I could go back to the right how I could make a different decision, how I could walk in obedience to God even though I did not feel like a victor. I still felt very much like a victim. And then there comes that first good decision and you can't even believe it was you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you can't even believe it's you. I want to show you a, a picture of something because it's just like, I just keep thinking about it. Um, my sister-in-law um, was down. Both my sisters-in-law were uh, in town here recently because we were moving Keith's parents into um, a brand new house in the country. And so they were, they were down. And while she was down, she said, Beth, I I'm just dying to show you something. So she takes me over to a little cage. And she pulls out this little creature in her hand. Look at it carefully. And I, I want you to see it in Mary's hand so you can see how big it is. Do you know what it is? It is a squirrel. It is a squirrel. Now listen to the story. My other sister-in-law, Tina, is not nearly so creatureful uh, as Mary and as some of us may be. She's got a cat. And her cat, a couple of weeks ago, brought this in in her teeth. The cat brings it in the house. Of course, she's thinking it's a hairless rat. She doesn't have any clue what it is, but she just like is horrified, and she goes, it's a wonder. Listen, it would have just taken a little clamp down jaw on the thing, and it would have been dead. Because they, uh, Mary figures it was about, oh, five or six days old at the time when the cat dragged it in. Talk about what the cat dragged in. And so she brings it in. Well, she does not know what to do with it. She, and she can tell it's alive because it's, it's squirming, and she calls her sister, and her sister says, I want it. I want the thing. And do you know she got on the internet to see what you're supposed to do with it? And do you know that you can buy um, canned cat's milk? And that's what you, next time you find a baby squirrel. <laughs> there really is canned cat's milk. Now, I can't think any of that through, and I don't want you to either. <laughs> do not go there with me. Don't get me started on it. But somehow there is canned cat milk. I don't know how. I can't explain that. But she, so she feeds it with a little dropper. And I mean, it's gotten to where it nestles in her hand and she feeds it numerous times a day and she'll be able to let it go at about 12 weeks. I mean, it looks hideous to us. Just hideous to us. And yet, I just want you to imagine what we looked like. What did we look like? I mean, well, you talk about what the cat dragged in. I, I want you to hear some words out of Ezekiel 16. I I'm not going to have you turn there unless you just want to. What I'd, I'd rather you do is I, I want you to take a minute and I want you to remember your history with God. What condition have you been found in at some point by the Lord Jesus? I know where he found me. 
Where did he find you? And maybe it was not the moment of your salvation. Maybe it was just the moment of your deepest depravity or defeat or hatred. There's somebody listening today among 180,000 people. Somebody here has had somebody in their life that they flat out hated. And Jesus Christ has the art of curing souls. He does not just do it as his job. It's his art. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Ezekiel 16 verse 4 reminds me of something that happened to me. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. I'm not saying that was you, but I'm saying for some of us, we have felt rejected from the very beginning, thrown out into an open field. Maybe someone stood over us and went, straighten up, straighten up says, then I passed by and I saw you kicking about in your own blood and you lay there in your blood. I said to you, live. And I made you grow like a plant of the field and you grew up and you developed and you became the most beautiful of jewels. Nothing gives God more glory than us being able to say of one another, look what the lion of Judah dragged in. He dragged me in. This is what the cat dragged in. I don't care. I don't care how it might look for any of us who try to dress it up from the outside. Listen, we better be glad Jesus came as a physician for the sick and as a, a friend to the sinners because we have been them. We have been them. What point are we on? Anybody know? We're on point number four, and it is this. Jesus became a friend of sinners so we could become a friend of God. Jesus became a friend of sinners so that we could become a friend of God. I just had something on my mind. Um, I have someone in my life that I really, really love that has recently been in um, a hole of defeat again. Can anybody say again? Anybody know what that's like when just like again? Here we go again. And uh, the person was wondering if this was the time when uh, the immediate loved ones would finally say, enough is enough, there are no more chances, but it didn't happen. The person was graced once again. But it was so interesting that the person was telling me how mad they were at someone else and was refusing to forgive someone else. And God has placed it on my heart because I've been there before. I know what this is like. You cannot come up with, the, um, with an area of defeat I've not at least somewhere touched my toes into if I did not jump like do a cannonball right in the middle of. I know what this is like. But it occurred to me and I said to my loved one, I said, you realize that God is giving you grace through a whole lot of people and you're withholding it from someone. I said, you know he's never going to let you get away with that. That's the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18. You're not going to get away with that. And I, I want us to be reminded today, I need to be reminded, you need to be reminded, we are a people who have been graciously graced. And, and is it that we are that person today? Whether it's on this side of that screen or that side of the screen, we are the person today that has been graced and forgiven not only by Christ, but He has moved on some of the people around us to give us graciousness and to have mercy upon us, and yet we still withhold it from somebody else we know. I thought to myself, you know, sometimes what has got us bent over 
is the malady of our bitterness and our unforgiveness. And the thing about it is it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. Do you know that the picture of biblical unforgiveness, one of the words, there are two main words that are used for forgiveness in the New Testament um, Greek. And, and one of them is the word aphiomi, and it means to let's, to send something forth, to send something forth. And, and the opposite picture of it is that when, when you and I have someone that we refuse to forgive, when it goes on long enough, it becomes not just an action, but a lifestyle. And we don't just become a person who does not forgive, we become, stay with me here, an unforgiving person. And then we'll find that it will bleed into every one of our relationships. And that we're holding grudges all over the place. And we look around us and go, I have no good company. Because we're mad at everyone we know. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I can remember, you know, when, when my girls would come in and they would just be mad at all of their friends. And we kind of get tickled because I'd go, you know what? You're the only common denominator of all of your friends. <laughs> Isn't it odd that... You're mad at all of them. I mean, if you're mad at all of your peeps, I mean, like, like you're thinking, I don't even want to go home. I'm so mad at all of them. Something's wrong in here. I'm not saying something's wrong not there. But God alone can deal with that. But we're just getting like, it's just getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And if you and I do not deal with our bitterness and unforgiveness, we're going to be as flat as a pancake and miserable to boot. Today is the day for some forgiveness. We need the forgiveness of Christ. We need the forgiveness of Christ displayed through some others in our lives. But Girlfriend, we got to come and we got to give some forgiveness. That today is the day that we just give it up to God. You don't have to send it forth into oblivion. We just send it forth to Him. We go, you handle it. It's too much for me. We need grace. Could anybody say, I need grace? I need, then we got to give it. Say, I've got to give grace. Say it out loud. I've got to give some grace. Got to give some grace. What was that last point? Jesus came as a friend of sinners so we could become friends of God. Friends of God. Okay, would you turn with me? I want to show you another place that the words most excellent are used. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Some of the same wording. I, th I think some of you are going to find this to be so cool. Okay, hold on there. And you guys right here, since y'all are so on top of things, do not let me forget to come back to it while I tell this story right here. Okay, listen. See if you don't think this is fascinating. Do you remember that in Luke 1, verse 3, Luke refers to Theophilus as what? Remember the honorific? What was it? Most excellent Theophilus. Then in Acts 1, 1, he just refers to him as just Theophilus. There's no honorific there in the terms of the scholars. Now, let me tell you what some of the um, writers of commentaries think is the difference between the two. They think that there's every possibility Theophilus was not saved when, when Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but that he was saved by the time he wrote uh, the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, that he was saved by then because they're saying, and I found this to be very intriguing, that in the stretch of the New Testament terminology, that once someone became a brother and sister, once someone became a, an also, or if I say I'm an also, once they entered into the big we, that, that worldly distinctions were no longer used in their addresses. They were addressed as the beloved of God, the people of God. They were, their, their honorifics all became um, 
very, very God-centered. Their dignity then uh, was in Christ and Christ alone. So it's interesting because when he drops it off the second time, there is every likelihood that a much greater thing has happened to him. And that's that he has become not someone who is only educated in the things of the Scripture, but he has received the Savior, the living Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, what was the honorific? Tell me again two words. All right, I want you to see here in 1 Corinthians 12, the very last part of the chapter, very, very end, you'll see it in a segment all by itself. He's told about all the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is Paul talking. And then he says this, and now I will show you the what? Oh, tell me again from way down here. Most excellent way. You want to be a most excellent friend of God? It is in one big word, L-O-V-E, love. You want to know what most excellence is to us? You want to know what our honorific is in this segment of time? You and I were called to love. This is the more excellent way. No matter what we've been through, no matter what we've been victimized by, we overcome through the call to love. You know how you can get back at that person that has done so much to you? Love them. It will drive them crazy. It will just drive them crazy. Listen, I want you to know there are people that are enjoying having power over you. They, they're having a good time with it because you're like going, you know, going all victim on them. Anybody know what I'm saying? And so they just love it and they just keep doing it. What if you were no longer a victim? What if you were empowered by the, the pervasive, invasive love of Christ and he gave you the ability to love somebody that despises you? You know what kind of power there is in that? You want to talk about empowerment to the child of God? You want to be a most excellent friend of God? There is a more excellent way and that way is to love. That way is to love. The Lord's been showing me something here lately. I've just been making me really aware of it in various surroundings. I've talked to them about it a couple of weeks ago in Salt Lake City. So if any of you guys are with us today, this is going to sound familiar to you. But God began to make me really aware of how often we just say to someone, love you, love you. We'll sign some off, love you. And we're just, you know, just easy to say. A lot of times we'll just spell L U V you, love you, love you. But why is it we're so reluctant to put the eye on it? Has anybody ever thought of that before? Like, like when, when was the last time you just kind of, you know, I hug somebody, I can go, love you, love you. But what would be the difference in, no, I, I'm not talking about just like, I mean, like, who loves you? Who out there loves, well, God loves you. Some, surely someone must love you, but it's not exactly me. I mean, just like, love you. I hope love to you. I, I don't necessarily want it to be me, but love you. Surely someone loves you. Anybody? Anybody? I mean, does anybody do that besides me? I just like, oh, you do too? Oh, you do too? And God began pressing it on my heart. Put your eye back in your love you. Because, you know, we don't want to sit out there and be all exposed. Because what about the times when someone does not say it back? And doesn't it happen? Like you just put yourself out there. I love you. And like they just went, okay. Or when was the, doesn't it happen? Don't you have an aunt that that happens with every time? Don't you have that person in your life that you put yourself out there and you hug and they stand here like this? You think, what would it take? I mean, help me here. I mean, you want to also get there and say, let me help you. But there's something so transparent, something so out there to go. No, I'm not just saying somebody out there loves you. I'm going to tell you something. No, actually, I do. I do. It's one of the sweetest things I've thought about it a million times since two weeks ago because when I shared this with the Salt Lake City group, after it was over and I went past all my buddies, listen, we, we, every, this is such a team. I just love them all so much. And when I walked back past them two weeks ago, one of them grabbed me by the arm, a guy, a guy, and he looked at me, he goes, Beth. He said, Beth, 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 I love you. I love you. I just looked him right back in his face. I went, oh, I love you too. I love you too. When was the last time you just put your eye back in your love you? 
I was called to love. You were called to love. We're going to get ourselves back in our love you. I want you now to hold on to Luke 1, 4, and then hold on to Acts 1, 3. So get both of those in uh, your hand with me, please. All right, Luke 1, verse 4. I better back it up to 3. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me, everybody say also to me, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus, had been taught. Everybody goes, he has been taught. Everybody say, he had been taught. This is not a man that had not been taught. For many of us, through 180,000 individuals, many of us have been taught. Some of you may be brand new to it. Some of you may have never been in this um, kind of atmosphere before. But for a lot of you, I mean, we've been taught. We've been taught. But he said, I want you to know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Now look at Acts 1 verse 3. He said, after his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men, talking about his apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Look back at that again. He showed himself to these men and he gave them many convincing proofs. I love the King James Version here. Many infallible truths. Somebody say infallible truths. Infallible. Say it again, infallible truths. Infallible. He gave them many certainties that he was alive. I want you to write down our um, fifth point, if you would please, and let's build on it for our remaining few minutes together. You and I, we can revel in the certainty of the things that we've been taught. You and I really can have some certainty about the things that we have been taught. Now I want you to tell it back to me. Number five is this. We can... Very good, and that was very clear. And this time I want you to say it again, but I want a really loud, especially here in Lubbock, I want a really loud certainty. And on the other side of that screen, I want to hear certainty from you. Let's try it again. We can we revel. revel in the certainty of the things that we've been taught. These things were certain. I want to show you something that I hope will bless you. You see the word taught there when it says that the certainty of the things you've been taught in Luke um, chapter 1, uh, verse 4, when he's talking about, when he uses that word taught, it is a word that I want you to see on the screen. If you'll go ahead and bring that up, Adrian. That word taught is the word katakeo, katakeo. Everybody say katakeo. Hey. Say it one more time. It's fun to say. Hey. This time we're going to put a real sharp k k katakeo. Say it again. Hey. Now, do you see any similar word there in English? taught catechao, catechism, catechism. And although in that early day it was not nearly the formal training that it began to be um, centuries later, still they were very much taught the doctrine of salvation through Jesus Christ and how he had fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. And so he's coming to the most excellent Theophilus and he is saying, listen, you don't have to just go by what you've been taught and only think that that's the end result. Everything God teaches us is Him reaching us. Does anybody understand that with me? What can happen to us is that you and I, is that you and I can get all wrapped up in Bible study and forget that the reason we were in it is to know our God and His Son, Jesus Christ. My friend Pris Priscilla Shire yesterday I tweeted something that I jotted down under this point. She said, my heart aches for those who are trying to live godly lives, dot, 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 without God. <laughs> trying to come to Bible study. I, I met a woman a couple of weeks ago that was just there that she, she just professes that she does not receive Christ as who we believe him to be in the scriptures. But she said, but I love your Bible studies. Well, I mean, it just flew all over me. I'm going, you know what? He's the only reason we're having Bible study. 
Everything about the Word was to bring us into a place of relationship. This is not just a text. You and I are not just trying to get educated here. We're not trying to just get knowledgeable here. We are having a relationship with the Creator who spoke the universe into existence. This is big. This is big. And the reason why so many of us don't have certainty, stay with me here, this is not a condemnation, it's just a biblical fact. Some of the reason why many of us don't have certainty about it is because we're trying to have Bible study without Jesus. We're trying to just learn stuff. Uh, we're trying to learn our apologetics and all our theology without understanding that we were brought into a place to get to know the living Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, he said, I know whom I believed in, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what has been entrusted to me until that day. You've got to know the one. Our certainty is in the one, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Um, there is a wonderful uh, translation, Eugene Peterson's translation of 1 John 1, 1 through 4. I want you to hear it. From the very first day, we were there taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes. We verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we are telling you in both sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it, and now we're telling you so that you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too, and your joy will double our joy. Listen, they did not give their lives in very painful ways over a man they hoped was the Savior. Yes, we are called to faith. But I need you to know something today, girlfriend, especially somebody that's new to this surrounding with us. Our faith is based on fact, convincing proofs. There was proof that he overcame the grave. Proof, infallible, convincing proofs. They saw him. They touched him. They fellowshiped with him. They knew him. They knew him. We look back at their lives and think they were so blessed. They, they didn't have any doubt. They got to lay eyes on him. But you know what John 20 verse 29 says? It says, Jesus said back to them, listen, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet they have believed. Blessed are we. Blessed are we. I want you to look at one another and say, we're more blessed than they were. Because he said, blessed are you when you haven't seen and yet you believe. But I, I asked somebody the other day, uh, by only, I only a text, how she was doing. And she took me up on it when she answered me. It was the most wonderful thing she actually told me. And I asked her, she's somebody very, very, very much in ministry. And I asked her, I said, can I share your text? Because I read it and read it. And I want to read it to you. What I had said was, and I, 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 I greeted her, said a couple of things to her. And at the end of it, I said, how are you? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Because I knew she was going through such a rough time. And I want you to hear this. I'm doing really well. So very, very much has happened since we saw each other last. Without exaggeration, there is not one single thing in my life that has not gone through a death of some sort. Even if it was good and necessary transition, I am in that petrifying, beautiful, luminous, painful, and hopeful space where it is very dark, but His hand is very warm holding mine. My future is a blank canvas, and if you knew her situation, you'd know what she meant. My future is a blank canvas on every front, but I'm already dabbling with painting it in rich, deep, and bright colors. When it isn't terrifying, it's actually quite fun. Anybody know what she's talking about? When I'm not terrified. Actually, Jesus is blowing my mind. 
She says this, God is good all the time. And when he, it appears that he is not, it is because he's great. If you're not sure he's good, know that he's great. The Apostle Paul said at the very end of Philippians, I have learned the secret, the secret. I've learned the secret. And there's a secret that you can't really tell anyone in advance in a way that they can totally receive. They have to experience it for themselves. But here is the secret, that the more you need Him, the more you see Him revealed. The more desperate you are for Him, the more he will come out in ways that are so mind-blowing that you feel like at times you are the only one on the planet. When it seems the darkest of all, maybe that's when he's got you in the cleft of the rock and he's covered you there with his hands. I don't know what you're going through right now. I wish that I could really know how you are. But I know this, I know your God intends to be faithful to you. And I know that he has allowed you to come into that place because there is a level of intimacy you can have with him right there that you will not experience in any other season of your life, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, even if you have no idea what you're returning to after today is over. Even if you're wondering if your whole family is going up in flames. God is faithful. Your God is faithful. Your God is faithful. I'm going to ask the praise team to come, and I want you to come into a place with me over these last couple of moments. Where we can have an invitation for people who may never have had a time or an opportunity to receive Christ can come and make the most important decision of their lives. We hope with all of our hearts that people have come today somewhere amid this 180,000 that have never met Jesus Christ personally. And we want to give them an opportunity. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He, we don't know Him as Savior just because our parents did. We don't know Him as Savior because we were raised in a Christian home or because we, raised, we were raised um, in a Christian school. When people say to you, I, I've, I've been saved all of my life, that is a scriptural impossibility. There has to come a time when we have accepted the gift of salvation and received Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And it's not about becoming any kind of denominational tag. It's about becoming saved and having the certainty. I want somebody that's been asking Jesus into their heart a hundred times over the last 10 years, let's get done with it. You can have certainty about the one you believe in. You can know you are saved. And do you know what the enemy would lose today if 180 women were leashed out of these places knowing that they had on the helmet of their salvation, that they were saved in Christ and nothing could pluck them out of the hand of God, what would happen then? Listen, the enemy knows good and well that if he can keep you down in your salvation, you're never going to be a danger to him on the battlefield. Never. Because you can't even decide whether or not you're saved. Is he having that game with anybody? Today's the day. Today's the day. All it takes is once. And we're going to do this today, and if you've done it 50 times before, well, good. Let's be done with it today. Because we can know that we are saved. We can know that we are. It may be that some of you, God's going, well, you know what? You really did that 10 years ago, and it took. Because if it was real, it took. But if it makes you feel better to do it again today, let's do it again today. But you were saved 10 years ago. For somebody else, this is life and death. I'm going to ask you all to stand with me all over our 731 locations. All of you stand. And I wonder if you'd repeat this prayer after me. It's not magic words. It's not a, a formula. It's a simple invitation 
In Romans chapter 10, it says, if you will confess with your mouth what you believed in your heart, that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. That's it. That's it. It's so simple that the educated won't receive it because there's got to be more to it than that. Listen, the more to it came from Christ. He said, listen, I've done it all. All you have to do is believe it. And that's what we do today. I wonder, I'm going to say some phrases and I'm going to ask you to repeat them after me, but I'm going to ask you all to do it. Most of us, uh, perhaps in this room, will do it by remembrance, something that was a decision we made years ago. But for somebody else, this is her first time. So let's go with her there and let's, let's commune with her there and let's be her good company today and let's give her a little uh, support in the most important decision of her life. Would you pray after me? Father of heaven and earth, thank you for sending your son to die for all of my sins, past, present, and future. Today on September 10th, 2011, I receive your gift of grace. I want to turn from my destructive way. And I accept your son as my personal savior. I believe with my heart. And now publicly this day, I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. So today this matter is settled. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' delivering name. And somebody say hallelujah and amen. Welcome somebody. Welcome somebody to the family of God. Praise you. Thanks for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Living Proof and Beth Moore. Hey friends, we're so glad you stopped by our channel. Our passion at Living Proof Ministries is to see you grow to love and live on God's Word. That's what we want to do and that's what we want to help you do through providing weekly Bible study programs. Please subscribe so that you don't miss a single thing and let's grow together. 